Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Dr. Andrew Awuni, the Director for Education at Access. I'm so glad to be talking about home health value-based purchasing, strategies for improvement. During this presentation, we'll be discussing rationales for performance improvement, key steps for the performance improvement process, and strategies for improving some measures. When we think about the challenges in healthcare and opportunities for improvement, there are three key areas that come up, also known as the triple aim, as formulated by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. A number of organizations, individuals, and groups came together representing all sectors of the healthcare industry and the general public in providing comments. And that's where these three overarching aims came from, looking at the overall health of a population across settings and across time, being able to deliver that care in a manner that patients receive the best experience of care, and doing so at an affordable cost. There are six domains that were identified through the National Strategy for Quality Improvement in Healthcare as mandated by the Affordable Care Act. Part of this focus is represented in January 2015 when the Secretary for Health and Human Services announced that CMS was moving to reimbursing providers based on quality rather than the quantity of care being provided, along with a fairly aggressive timeline. To watchers of the industry, this did not come as a surprise, considering that we've known for a while that the sharply increasing rates of the cost of health care, as we all experience in our own pockets, continue to go up. The Affordable Care Act legislation essentially required CMS to implement value-based purchasing in all the programs that they have oversight over, including home health, essentially tying reimbursement to the quality of care being provided through beneficiaries' experiences and their outcomes, essentially incentivizing the system to deliver quality care and lead to a more sustainable payment system. There is some precedent for this. The home health Pay for Performance demonstration, which was conducted between 2008 and 2010, found modest quality improvements in a number of measures. However, part of the conclusion was due to the limited amount of time for the trial and due to how it was set up in terms of incentivizing providers, there were some additional opportunities for improvement. The President's budget for 2015 and 2016 also included proposals for value-based purchasing being extended beyond hospitals to other care settings, such as skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, and so on and so forth. So essentially, the home health value-based purchasing system was initiated in nine states in January of 2016, using 2015 as a baseline year. The performance of 2016 will be used to make up to, that is, up or down, of 3% in calendar year 2018. These adjustments will continue to increase percentage-wise all the way up to 8% for 2020 and conclude in the year 2022. So that's a high-level overview. CMS is serious about reimbursing for quality over quantity of care. Another consideration when we think about trying to understand strategies for improving care for those who may not be actively involved in performance improvement at this point, is the fact that CMS has tabled over the last few years an update to the conditions of participation. In October of 2014, CMS proposed an update to the home health conditions of participation. Part of the proposed updates include assurances of protection and the promotion of patient rights, enhancing the process for the planning, delivery, and coordination of services to patients, streamlining regulatory requirements, and essentially establishing, once and for all, a foundation for ongoing, data-driven, and agency-wide quality improvement. This is the first update since 1989. One of the new requirements in the COP is for home health agencies to develop, implement, and essentially maintain an agency-wide quality assessment and performance improvement program. This is part of a move toward a more prospective quality of care approach based on quality improvement. The data to be used for measuring quality is already being collected by CMS through the OASIS and published in 
various outcome and process reports, and other industry efforts currently underway. So what does QAPI stand for? Well, QAPI essentially is quality assurance, which is a retroactive view of care being provided and assuring that the care meets quality standards, combined with performance improvement, where we're constantly looking for areas of improvement while also testing new approaches to fixing the underlying causes of the problems. CMS has proposed a QAPI framework. The framework is comprised of five standards. Executive responsibility, looking at the scope of a program, the data and the activities that the agency will conduct, while also implementing various performance improvement projects. So let's take a look at executive responsibility. Without effective leadership, there's no quality improvement project or performance improvement project that can be successful. The role of the home health agency's governing body is to assume that leadership responsibility by ensuring that there is a program in place and that it represents all the various complexities of the home health agencies and the personnel involved in the services provided. It involves reviewing contracts and other business relationships that might have impact on the quality of care that's being provided by the agencies. Reviewing the indicators that need to be improved, addressing the home health agency's performance, and making sure the appropriate documentation is maintained for these programs and are available to surveyors. They also propose that the governing body establish clear expectations for patient safety and appropriately address any findings of fraud or waste. The next domain looks at the program scope, ensuring that the agency utilizes appropriate process measures to assess all its services and operations, tracking patient outcomes, and analyzing and tracking quality indicators to determine whether the desired outcomes are being reached, including adverse patient events. The next domain is the program data, where the QAPI program identifies appropriate quality indicator data, such as from the OASIS and HHCAPS, and using this data to identify and prioritize the improvement opportunities. The home health agency goals should focus on high risk, high volume, and problem prone areas that are identified by the agency. Using the collected data, the measurement tools, and appropriate quality measures to monitor the effectiveness and safety of its services, as well as the quality of care. By ensuring that they focus on a high risk, high volume, problem prone, or issues that are identified by the agency. The fourth area are the specific activities that are used to run the program. These activities need to be focused on addressing the high-risk, high-volume, and problem-prone areas that were identified with the data, also remaining vigilant to any emergent issues that endanger the patient's health and safety or that are uncovered in the process of quality improvement. The fifth domain addresses the performance improvement plan and the fact that at least one performance improvement plan must be documented annually reflecting the scope complexity and the past performance of the agency's services and operations. The performance improvement plan, although there's not a required template, should focus at least on past performance areas which have proven to be problematic, clear evidence of poor patient outcomes, and the fact that it was high risk, high volume, and how the home health agency undertook a QAPI project, why it was conducted, and the measurable progress achieved. So we've essentially talked about home health value-based purchasing as one of the drivers for improving the quality of care in our agencies. And we've also reviewed the pending change to the conditions of participation. Let's talk a little bit about a roadmap for integrating performance improvement. Without leadership buy-in, all efforts will be unsuccessful. Leadership sets the culture. The culture of your organization must be geared towards quality and patient safety. Without the right personnel on board, with a mindset of patient safety and quality, with the rapid changes in healthcare and in such a heavily regulated industry, information technology and the right technology partner becomes extremely crucial. Setting the agency's priorities and goals, establishing a culture that's focused on the patient and on quality, identifying the right partnerships to achieve quality goals, assigning personnel and resources to achieve these priorities and goals, and obviously being interested in monitoring the change efforts and sustaining and spreading these changes over time are all the rules of leadership. One of the best and most widely recognized models is the model for improvement as put out by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. 
it's a very simple model. It starts with what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that the change is an improvement? What changes can we make that will result in an improvement? And then going through a performance improvement cycle where we plan the improvement, perform, study our activities, and then act. And going through this in a continuous manner leads to improvement. So we can essentially summarize this in three phases for improvement, initiating the change, managing it, and making it permanent. So when initiating change, there are three steps, creating the performance improvement team, identifying the measures, and working on our aim statement. This could be charted by the home health agency's governing body, or in much smaller organizations, might be the governing body themselves. Once the team has been appointed, there needs to be a lead person. Team members should be selected from key areas within the organization. Everything from having an executive sponsor to someone who understands technical aspects, department leads, the times the team will meet and the length of their commitment are also ideal items to outline. Once a performance improvement team or PI team has been selected, one of their responsibilities are to review the key data sources or at least identify them and ensure that your agency has access to them. Home Health Compare, the CASPER report, chart reviews, or other data sources within your organization that will give you insight into your measures. Once the data sources have been identified, reviewing various measures requiring improvement, those that are high risk, high costs, problem prone, and focusing in on two or three measures for improvement. Once those improve and are simply being monitored, you can move on to additional measures to ensure that you don't become overwhelmed. We want to think about our goal for improvement. What are we trying to accomplish? We need to ensure that all members of the performance improvement team understand the type of change that's being sought and when it will occur. The core components of the aim statement are related to what needs to be accomplished, where, for whom, by when, and must have measurable goals. An example of an aim statement is as follows, which is focused on improving the ability of patients to manage their oral medications such that the management of oral medications would be improved by at least 50%. Using OASIS data, they anticipate showing improvement in M2020 by 25% or more in three months. In phase two, now we need to manage the change. We want to establish the measures by which we'll determine the change has occurred, the key activities that will help us impact those measures, and we'll talk a little bit about how to run a performance improvement cycle. The next thing we need to do is establish the change measures. We really need to review and understand the definition of the measure that we've selected in our previous aim statement. Determine the data sources for this baseline assessment and any subsequent measurements. We need to review the current value for M2020 and then come up with a method for tracking and reporting this data and communicating it to other members of the team. So continuing with our example of M2020, which is the management of oral medications, and we can find the current value on Home Health Compare or within our CASPER reports and if we do chart audits. The definition is centered around the patient's current ability to prepare and take all their oral medications reliably and safely, including the administration of the correct dosage at the appropriate times and intervals. It does not include injectable and IV medications. And the note on this is it refers to the ability, not the compliance or willingness to take the medication. We've decided for our purposes that our reporting frequency will begin daily and then may move to weekly and as monthly as needed. What activities impact this particular measure. So we need to look at the current processes involved with the measure and if there are any related measures that might actually come out of this and review them for potential areas for improvement. So for example, we know that M2020 is an outcome measure, but there are a number of other process measures that might help us improve M2020, such as M2000, drug regimen review, and a number of the other medication-related OASIS items. The next step is we need to run performance improvement cycles. This is a core piece for bringing about real change. The PDSA cycle is a scientific methodology for testing and implementing change. By running multiple cycles, we truly drive towards improvement in an efficient manner. The plan, do, study, 
act cycle, or some people know it as the plan, do, check, act cycle. Four basic steps. Under plan, we're taking an objective view of what we intend to do, asking questions, making predictions, such as why this occurs, and we discuss our plan for what we'll do, who, what, where, when. When moving on to do, we carry out the plan, documenting problems, any unexpected observations or issues, and we begin the preliminary analysis of the data. Under the study, we'll look more in-depth at the data that we've collected, compare it to predictions, summarize what we've learned, and begin to think about how it informs what our next action needs to be. Under ACT, we draw some initial conclusions and figure out what we need to do next in the cycle. And we'll run through an example of this. Let's take a look at planning. During this step, we plan the test or observation and include a plan for collecting the data and being able to report out. What's the objective of the test? What predictions can we make about what may happen and why? Almost like a hypothesis. And then we begin to develop a plan for how we'll go about testing the change. Who, what, when, where, and as mentioned, what data needs to be collected. Here's a sample plan. Our objective is to review the medication documentation workflow and review three charts to determine how nurses are documenting M2020. We anticipate that some documentation may be missing, others poorly documented, and we'd like to believe that a number of them will also be well documented. In planning the test for M2020, we'll involve the DON, QI nurse, and a staff nurse. Each of them will ask two nurses each about their workflow for completing MU2020. They'll identify patients who have M2020 recently completed to identify documentation trends. This will occur over three days anytime during the workday. The interviews with the nurses may occur face-to-face -face, over the phone or reviewing the documentation in the EHR. Under DO, the goal is to try out the test on a small scale. Remember, the idea is not to overwhelm ourselves. We carry out the test, document any problems or observations, and begin the preliminary analysis of the data. Continuing our example, these are the notes that were taken during the do for round one. Each of the nurses implemented on two charts each. They were interrupted several times. Nurses indicated documentation was completed at home, some in the patient's home. Six total patient charts were reviewed. The start of care was missing in two charts. They were unable to find discharge, transfer, or death documentation on two charts, and two charts were completed. They concluded in their notes that they needed additional data. Under study, the team sets aside some time to analyze the data and study the results by completing the analysis of the data, comparing the data to the predictions, and reflecting on what was learned. Continuing with our example, six out of nine intended charts were reviewed. Four of those charts had documentation missing, so that's 67%. Documentation was present in two charts with care episodes. Before we can tackle the issue of M2020 and improving that particular measure, we need to address missing documentation issues. For two of the charts that had care episodes showed that at least M2020 was being documented. However, there was inconsistency in the documentation of the measure and there's a need to review additional charts to get a better idea. Although we don't have round two, a round two would be scheduling additional chart reviews, reviewing for additional missing documentation, and then reviewing the quality of the care episodes that are found to see whether M2020 is being appropriately and consistently documented before we would really tackle the issue of how to improve the scores. Realistically, it might not be till around three or four that we would be able to correct the missing documentation and begin to address whether M2020 was being appropriately documented. When we move to the act, we essentially refine our change based on the data that we've collected, determine what modifications need to be made, and start thinking about how to create a new plan, or at least what we would need to pass on for the next round of testing. So if we use our previous example, what we know we need to determine is the rationale for delayed documentation and its impact on M2020, educating nurses or other clinicians that are completing this documentation on ensuring that this is done in a timely manner, and reviewing additional charts to get a better sense for 
whether this is a trend. We also know that we need to dig a little bit deeper in determining whether M2020 is being appropriately documented in a CARE episode. We may also realize that our case mix of patients are impacting types of responses. But these are all potential considerations as we begin to consider planning for the next round. And so this gives you a general idea of what a single round would look like doing PDSA. You would do as many rounds as necessary to work through each of those issues. We may be going back and correcting or educating clinicians about M2020 so that with each round, we expect that we'll continue to see improvements. Phase three is making the changes permanent. We know that once we've made improvements, we've gone through multiple rounds, we want to ensure that we don't have to do this again, wasting time and resources to revisit processes that we've improved. We need to move effective changes into general practice. Some organizations do a pilot on a very small area, maybe with one or two nurses, and over time they spread that to additional nurses and other areas or other parts of the organization. So we need to ensure that we communicate our successes, utilizing champions to model and drive our changes, educating remaining staff on the enhanced workflow, clearly delineating what used to occur and what the new process or workflow should look like, and then ensuring that we're monitoring this improved workflow for compliance. Monitoring improvements periodically by reporting to key stakeholders and staff in the affected areas, and then documenting our process and outcomes of the project are extremely important, and then to identify additional areas for improvement where we can take on a new measure when we retire one that we've improved or that's in maintenance mode. We want to be able to identify additional areas for improvement, essentially retiring measures that we've maxed out on their improvement. As we indicated earlier, with the provisional change in conditions of participation, now is a good time to adopt documenting a quality assurance performance improvement plan. We need to ensure that we document a summary of our key findings, actions that we're taking, the results, and improvements that were made. Ongoing changes in healthcare require organizations to formalize their QAPI strategy. And the model for improvement and PDSAs are a best practice. Being able to celebrate and communicate success is crucial for generating additional success. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes the Home Health Value-Based Purchasing Strategies for Improvement webinar. Access is a technology company that provides innovative solutions to health organizations to effectively run their business. And we're very happy to have you as part of this webinar. Now, we empower healthcare organizations like yours with easy to use cloud-based software that integrates all aspects of your operations so you can improve patient outcomes while growing your business. We're the fastest growing home health technology company in the country today, trusted by more than 6,000 healthcare organizations. Over 150,000 users log in daily, serving over 1 million patients nationwide. The most successful home health care organizations trust Access. Access has achieved many firsts in the industry. Now, we're the only healthcare technology company approved to award continuing education units, CEUs by the American Nurses Credentialing Center, and also the most recommended home health care software by Software Advice. We're the only company to have a native mobile app that works on both Apple and Android devices. And Access is the first software company approved to provide CAP services. Access is a firm believer in continuing training, and we create content that you can access anywhere, anytime, to help you succeed and grow your business.